Divine Truth Spirit Experience Experiences of people who have lived on earth and who have now passed into the spirit world. In this recording titled Interview Series with Author Afra Frederick Winterly, Mary channels Frederick Winterly, known as Afra or Astrael, the author of books channeled in the early 1900s titled Through the Mists, The Life Elysian, and The Gate of Heaven, who comes at Jesus' request to interview him about his life and his books channeled by Robert James Lees. Recorded on the 23rd of October 2018 from 1 pm in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Session 1. Hello there, everyone, and Mary and myself are here today. How are you done? Yeah, I'm pretty tired. good. <laughs> <laughs> we've been pretty busy, haven't we? we? So, yeah, so we're, we were both here today and we decided we want to do a bit more channeling today. And today we wanted to, we've been talking and, and I've been talking a bit with Afra, uh, who is the author of the books that were written through Robert James Lees in the, in, in the early 20th century. And I wanted to talk to him about a lot of different matters. And I thought this is, today we could have a bit of a discussion, just a general discussion with Robert James, uh, with, with uh, Afra, um, who, well, he was really known on earth as Fred, Frederick Winterlay. So, um, you know, but, but from the books we know him as Afra. So, so what I'd like to do is just to have a talk with him today. And, uh, and then, and we were also thinking about at some point in this sort of series of discussions, inviting along Robert James Lees as well to have a discussion about the books themselves and, and, uh, and also, you know, the interpretation of the books uh, as, as far as they see it today so we, that, that yeah. we can discuss those particular things down the track. We did once before speak with Robert, didn't we? Mm. Uh, was that a video or an audio? I think it was an audio, but I'm not sure if yeah. it's on our website or not, to be honest. Oh, okay. uh, I don't know if it ever got there. But right. um, we have had a conversation with Robert James Lees before, the writer of the book, of yes. the books, obviously. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But not, uh, and, we, and Mary has had quite a number of different conversations with Afra over you know, walking down the street and those kind of things, <laughs> as we do. But but we haven't had any recorded conversations uh, with right. Afra either. So that's right. So. It always it's sometimes I'm a lot more relaxed with those informal discussions yeah. than when cameras are when rolling, the cameras are rolling yeah. lights are on me. And <laughs> yeah. So we'll see how we go. Yeah. Um, so so we'll see what happens or transpires today in our conversation. Just a general conversation today, and then. Tomorrow we may have a bit more detailed conversation about matters, depending on, on what happens. <laughs> so uh, that's what we're uh, going to do today. Hopefully you enjoy our conversation and, uh, and learn a little bit more, as we always happen to learn from our spirit friends generally. Well, hello. G'day there, how are you? <laughs> What's your name now? <laughs> yeah, you could call me Afra. <laughs> or Frederick. <laughs> Either one. Either one. <laughs> I'm not too attached. Yeah. As you know, it's not much of a big deal here. No, no. Um, and you were renamed Astral at the end of the Gate of Heaven, weren't you? So. <laughs> yes. Mm. I, I, while those things were somewhat significant because they marked a transition for myself mm. uh, I don't feel so attached to names yeah yeah that's why you know sometimes when I read books where you know different named persons come along as spirits and um, obviously a lot of it is just for the sake of their <laughs> earth, earth friends as the identification isn't it yeah. it, it is mm. it is especially as one progresses further and further there's such there's a lessened um emphasis on the spoken word really yeah. and so while it's wonderful to mark a transition and to make some changes i i feel now the transitions that i make are, are far different yes well uh, welcome thank you <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah. a pleasure to to speak with you in such a direct way yeah yeah we've had a couple of conversations haven't we but not uh not on definitely not on camera before from our perspective so the audience wouldn't know that but uh, yeah i just wanted to first uh, give you my appreciation as i have done before for the books as you know they helped me greatly and and each book i've probably read 20 times at least by now i think 
And uh, with each one, they keep, you know, bringing up reminders and memories and so forth. So mm. it's uh, wonderful to have them as a, as a library. And, and so we're very, very thankful for the effort that both yourself and, and Robert James Lee's put into writing the books and getting them published. Yeah. Mm. And I, while I receive your thanks, I always feel it is a, it is a little strange because the true gratitude I feel is owed to yourself and certainly I have a great deal of gratitude for what you have done and what you continue to do. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting how things go on roundabouts, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Spiritually speaking, who, who's on earth and who's, who's here? Yeah. 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 And also the fact that, you know, quite often we have interactions with different people not understanding the full uh, import, I suppose, or, or the full importance of them mm. at the time. And it's only later in retrospect or even sometimes hundreds of years later mm. that we see the full impact of the choices and decisions that we've made. Hey? Mm. Yes, I never thought that my books would or my efforts to, to convey truth to the, to the planet would one day result in assist, assisting you who yeah, has assisted yeah. me so yeah. very much. Yeah. The, the area where they really assist me is emotionally. It's like... And, and particularly, I notice, uh, and we'll get into a discussion in more detail about the books perhaps here as, as we go on with ta- chatting with you, if that's all right. Certainly. And, um, but, and, and maybe over the coming weeks or months, you know, we'll, we'll get into more detail. But just generally, I find that um, the books, ha- the way you've penned them, and, and, Robert, and Robert obviously wrote, uh, allowed them to be written as well through his, through his development. And... Yeah. Um, it, it, it's sort of the way that the language is very, um, what I'd call so, sort of encourages the soul to feel, you know, mm. and it's very hard to read the books without feeling. Mm. And particularly if you're connected emotionally, it's very hard to read the books without feeling. And, and that's what I enjoy so much about them is it, it, they bring up for me a lot, a lot of feelings. And a lot of your feelings on earth um, were very similar to... Yes. the feelings that I personally have now. So, yes. so that's also been quite helpful in a lot of ways. Mm. Mm. It was my great desire to build faith in people. I do see that, I do see what you're saying, that very many times hearing, hearing of the wonderful future that awaits everyone, uh, really, <laughs> mm. no matter where they pass into this life, there really is a wonderful future awaiting them and to be able to describe that and the opportunity that Mr. Lees gave me over uh, a great number of years really uh, to be able to share my experiences and my, it was such a, um, a revolution of my faith I suppose or a, a, a the the experience of passing was so wonderful for me in fact yeah and the feeling that there were many things that i had hoped or that i had thought or i had reasoned must be the case pertaining to love and god and so forth those things were all i was greeted by such a wonderful affirmation of the reality of those things that i had hoped for mm. and that grew such a faith in me and such a desire to to assist those as you say who share many and there are many on earth really who mm. share my sense the sense that i had one on earth of of feeling misplaced of feeling out of out of place amongst mm. my family or my society and mm. to to really inspire people to to not abandon what is good in the face of opposition to not abandon one's own uh moral reasoning and uh desires in the face of loneliness when when it seems that (laughs) really everyone around is against oneself to i i really wished to inspire people to continue those who had good desires, good intentions, uh, 
to to not to not give up. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, sort of. I suppose that's the first thing I'd like to, to discuss about uh, a bit about is that on earth it seems that so many people have a really strong sense of hopelessness. Mm. Um, I, I don't know if it's just loneliness or anything like that. It's more just hopelessness, a hopelessness of not ever being able to find out what the actual truth is or mm. hopelessness about ever being in a really loving you know, a re- a relationship or hopelessness about their life generally you know in terms of finding out whether their life means anything or what's the point of even being here and this kind of hopelessness sort of pervades a society a lot doesn't it so it does mm. it does and i do feel there is a growing sense of this hopelessness that you speak of and i also i was just <laughs> remarking to myself when you were discussing sin earlier today how much sin is really it it comes from this this place of hopelessness that that so many people justify their sin because they're angry about how hopeless they are and their their sense of desolation and lack of faith really encourages them to justify the sin that they are choosing to undertake, even though many people understand that they are in that moment sinning uh, and in fact doing something that is not for the good of themselves or for others or even for the, for the good of the planet. Mm. It, I notice time and again that this sense of hopelessness within people causes them to betray the, the callings of their conscience and the the callings of their own inner morality and to degrade themselves because mm. this hopelessness that exists seems to pervade everything. And it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that I myself felt quite, I, I wouldn't say hopeless, but there were many times where I felt quite desolate mm. when I was on, mm. on earth and many times where I felt I questioned, is it really worth it? Is what I think really, is this really bringing about good or mm. um, can I be right when so many others are telling me I'm wrong? Um, but I persisted, I suppose. Um, and what I notice is that so many people have <coughs> given up that persistence that now it is almost the norm for cynicism and hopelessness that is the norm of society. And now I, mm. I reflect on the fact that you who, who preaches, perhaps you don't like that word, but <laughs> who teaches <laughs> of, of, uh, of faith and goodness and the reward of morality and the reward of, of being oneself and feeling oneself, that very often you are viewed as the the uncomfortable outlier <laughs> mm. and quite attacked because of the hopelessness that is confronted when a hopeless person is presented with a person with faith yeah, and with hope. Yeah, and this, it's an interesting reaction, isn't it, that people have with this sort of desolate or hopeless feeling in that it's almost like they throw their hands up in the air and they say, well, just everything can go to hell then because, mm-hmm. <laughs> including myself, is really the, a lot of times what they feel. It, it, and that is a very apt description. Yeah, everything which is exactly what finishes hell. up happening. <laughs> yes. uh, and everything can just go, go because uh, and I, I can just do anything I want because what's the point uh, of, of even trying to resolve any of these questions anyway type of thing. And as you say, it's very much linked to this issue of faith, isn't it? Mm. This, this issue of do I really have any strong belief or, and faith that that being moral or good or you know as if we want to use more biblical sort of a term righteous mm. uh, but not in a self-righteous way but just being in li- aligned with right mm-hmm. actually has any benefit to yourself or other people yes, mm. yes it's very pervasive and and it takes courage to have faith in the face of so much hopelessness I yes think. What I notice is with this with this uh, feeling of a lack of faith, it, it drives so many. Not a, not only does it drive sort of this 
I, this sort of I give up feeling, but also it drives a lot of actual choice to, towards evil, mm. where, where, where the anger that is inside of a person because of the hopelessness builds to such an extent that, that they choose evil rather than good in situations where they're given the choice um, because they just feel it's almost like they want to take the rage of their hopelessness out on the the, the world around them. Mm. Yeah, and, and you notice that happening a lot in society today, mm-hmm. not not only individually but also collectively. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is as if gazing upon the earth, the conditions... The conditions since my time have not ever been very bright. No. Uh, or, and even before. But there are certain flavours or moods that pervade the earth at various times throughout yeah. uh, history. And at the moment it is as if this, this rage and hopelessness and, and as you very correctly described, the, the interplay between those two and the desire to punish others for one's sense of hopelessness. It does seem to be quite a, a flavour or a, or a state that is driving much of the sin which degrades further the condition of the earth at this, at this moment in yeah, time. which only results in everyone feeling even more hopeless, and, uh, unfortunately, mm. and, and therefore more driven to... You know, the cycle of sin is yes. like that, isn't it? It sort of drives you. This is something, obviously, we'll be talking about in our assistance group. And, mm. and you know, in, your, in the books that you channeled through, Robert, um, you know, obviously you talked about that interplay of sin and desire to sin and mm. what motivates the desire to sin quite a lot. So mm. there's some of the things I'll be uh, bringing up from <laughs> some of the things you've actually mentioned in, yes. the, in that discussion, obviously. Yeah. Yes, I, it, is, it is fascinating and it's fascinating how when one is caught in the cycle of sin, it becomes a reinforcement of the lack of faith, but also that um, the, the opposite positive cycle, which you know exists, mm. seems not only impossible or unachievable or unrealistic, but it does trigger this rage, this, this, the, the confrontation between what is possible and the current state is often the point of resistance, is it not? Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah as you know, I'm often looked upon as being quite idealistic and, mm. um, and you know, a dreamer, I suppose mm. is the best way to put it. Um, but, and, and it's interesting that people of faith are normally looked upon like that, mm. isn't it, um, as if they are basically dreamers because... It, if it doesn't match a person's current reality, then obviously um, it, it feels completely different when you're hearing about it. And this is, I suppose, the difference, isn't it, between the earth life and the spirit life. On the earth, you, you didn't get the fee- as much of the feedback, if you like, of your condition versus and, and this, the beliefs that you held uh, and developed over the period of your life. As much as you did, as soon as you started, as soon as you arrived in the spirit world, really from the very first interaction, you know, with it was Avarez, I think it was picking up the child from you, mm-hmm. and then you know Helen coming to meet you. Mm-hmm. From there on, it's just a constant, uh, constant affirmation of yes. of what you had previously. You could probably say previously only really hoped and imagined was true yes uh, and, yes uh, but now you were being it was being confirmed to you mm-hmm. through every interaction and and i think people on earth because of that uh because the earth itself is in such a poor state they can't even pro- appropriately measure the feedback that they get when they do do good things mm, um, that is very true yeah. that is very true and and that is something that did help me persist in my life on earth. While there were many things I hoped for but did not really yet have faith in and I did experience some times of desolation, uh, I, did, I did have a sense that my moral actions were having a benefit. I, mm. At times it was difficult for me to, to measure that benefit 
uh, but there was a, a knowing or a, mm-hmm. an understanding that that was the case. Mm-hmm. Other times it was quite tangible um, in terms of the people that I assisted and the, the relief that I saw in the, the lives of certain people. But mm. uh, in other instances, it was merely an inner sense, I suppose. I was thinking about the, your life on Earth a bit, if I, we could maybe talk a bit about mm. life on Earth. And then right. I would like to mention something. You mentioned my passing into the spirit life and, yeah. and what my experience was then. And yeah. I did want to clarify something about sure. that for your viewers also. Sure. So um, perhaps like I could do, do that, that now. Yeah. Yes. I find it interesting that many people upon reading the books, they have a number of different responses. Some feel that it is fantasy <laughs> <laughs> or a, a lovely, um, Which really what's the term, from science fiction, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, uh, a fiction of some Spiritual sort. fiction, shall we yes. call it, <laughs> <laughs> rather than science fiction, many don't look upon it as science. <laughs> yes, uh, or a, a, a wonderful imagining, for yeah. example. And yes, that is driven by <clears throat> cynicism largely, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then others who engage with it, many times they are overwhelmed by the, the love of God inbuilt into to mm. the life. And, mm. and that is part of my intended desire, that mm. people should come to see and understand the love of God that mm. is really imbued into every mechanism of mm. the universe. But there are others who, who perhaps... I cannot say it's true faith, but have a sense or a, I'm not sure how to best say it, but a, a very childish view that their own experience will match mine. And maybe they hope that more than <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's not a knowledge, but it is a desire to live in that fantasy. Mm-hmm. If if that makes sense, to cling to those messages where, um, where I demonstrated the, the benefits of my own actions on earth and the wonderful gifts I received as a result. And many people then wish to say that their own lives on earth are comparable. And this is, this is a dangerous, uh, fallacy really yeah very very dangerous isn't it really yes Mm -hmm. my experience was somewhat special and unique Uh, each person's is unique uh we should say that yes but it was driven by my already very established desire on the earth to seek god's truth about Mm. all things to assist others in whatever way possible to ease suffering uh, and to really rid <laughs> the lives and the world of the detritus of, of modern religion. And so those factors all combined to create an experience which I then conveyed in the books. And many times I've reflected that what a wondrous experience, firstly, but just that I was given such a gift through, I had, I had prepared the ground, if you like, for this experience to be possible, but I was given this gift of so many experiences and such a, such a diverse exposure to many things because I already had those factors in play and it was known that I would, I would share many of these things on the earth. Mm. And so, it was a gift not just from myself, but those many who I recount the stories of and my mm. interactions with in the books. And I, I do at times have the sense that many people believe that their transition will be just as smooth. And while I don't wish to now diminish the faith <laughs> that I've established <laughs> in people, because this is not a question about God's love or, or the wonder that is possible in the spirit life, it should be said that everything that I experienced could, could be experienced by anyone, but they must first do the work to develop the capacity and the, the um, 
Yes, the capacity, the the ability for those things to happen and mm. for their desire to lead them in those ways. So, yeah. And if we're being really honest, the majority of people on earth don't even have much of a desire for truth at this stage. No. And, and it's very rare, in fact, to find a person with the kind of desire for truth that you actually had on earth. It, 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 given the fact, too, that we're now 100 more, more years removed from that time, and the hopelessness of the earth has grown even more <laughs> dim Indeed. since that time. Indeed. And so it, it's sort of like, you know, it is a rare thing to find a person with that level of desire for truth and also that level of desire to help others in a sincere way without uh, having some adulation or some cre credit for helping others. Mm -hmm. So these are all very rare qualities. And I think, I think anybody reading the books would have to see that while you, it, it's quite clear when you're reading the books that are about your feelings, which is mm. really good. I, fi I find that that's really good. At, in a lot of channel material, that's not the case, mm. where you don't get to feel the feelings of the person who's actually, you know, the spirit who's actually channeling to the person on earth. Mm. And it's great in your book because you, you, you got to feel the feelings, but you also got to see the real feelings you had about certain matters and how strong those feelings were. And if a person is truly self-reflective. I don't think they could ever go, oh, I'm the same as Afra was, because mm. for, me, for most, you know, who read, yeah. because the reality is for the majority of us, we've had another 100 years of Western society for the pe many people who read your books at mm. this stage. They, many of them are in Western societies and, and we've had 100, another 100 years of quite self-indulgent Western society, Indeed. Um, which, which has also further destroyed the condition of the soul. So, so for many of us, we, we don't have, I think if we're realistic, we'd have to see that we don't have those same qualities and therefore could not arrive in the same, yes. <laughs> with the same experience. That's mm. right. And again, I'm not pointing this out in order to, to create now a negative sense for no. people, but no. rather to really underline and define the fact that one's own personal aspirations and condition and I say this many times mm. in, in, the in the books, does dictate where, not just where one enters, but the, the experiences that yes. a person has. And so yes. I had a vast number of experiences in very rapid succession. Almost I was overwhelmed constantly. But all driven by this really extreme, I suppose you could say, as it would appear on earth, people would call it an extreme desire for truth. <laughs> I feel yes. it's a very passionate desire for truth and a, and a wonderful thing. Yes, yeah. and, and desire to assist and to ease the suffering of yes. others. And so I suppose one of my points is that many people, when they enter the spirit life, they have a slower change. They yes. have a slower timeline of experiences. And frequently they're even earthbound for many years before Ma many they arrive, years. isn't it? Yeah. Many years, many mm. years. But for your viewers, I point this out because I see many who are neglecting the personal work, mm. the personal development of aspiration which will ensure a wonderful future and, in fact, increase their current happiness. Uh, so I also, you mentioned many of the qualities that I had established. Uh, we've spoken about them, but I was also willing to confront my family's uh, yes. belief systems. Uh, and, so and be the ostracism of your family. Yes. Yeah. And many believe that this is, a, this is a terrible thing, and certainly it's not pleasant no. uh, to, to experience. And Particularly one, as you're going through it and breaking yes. away from that, you know, from that uh, family-based, you could call it really, it's an indoctrination of a certain type of way of life, isn't it? That's correct. Right. And, and really something that I have learned here in the spirit life is not that everyone must have a different belief to their family, but that one must do take their own personal journey of questioning belief including and very importantly beliefs imbued by the family mm. into the person before they can reach a state where they are their own self their own individual who is capable of of having these sort of desires and aspirations that lead a person into growth and change there's two things I'd like to ask you about mm. your earth life a bit. One, 
Uh, and the first one is logic, which we'll get to a bit later. And the yes. next, the, but the one that, that your statements just raise is the condition of your own father compared to your condition. And um, like, as a child, you would have had a choice to accept your father as mm. way of life mm. and gain his approval yes. and acceptance, but also end up probably being in a very similar condition to your mm. father. Mm. Or this other choice that you actually made, which was to feel completely like, like separate from your father, to realise that a lot of your father's motivations and, and uh, desires were, were, let's call them frankly what they were probably, they were mostly... Bigoted. Like, sorry? <laughs> Bigoted. Yes, and, and some, in, in many cases quite devious in mm. some ways. Corrupted. Because, and corrupted. Mm. Yeah, um, probably corrupted is a better word than devious. But even then, occasionally, there's a, in your dad, I sometimes feel, uh, he, on his earth life, you mm. know, obviously he might have changed yes. quite a lot now. But um, on his earth life, definitely there was this underlying self-indulgence uh, mm-hmm. that drove a, a lot of behaviour that, that was really only driven for the satisfaction of personal addictions rather than any other motivation, mm. even though at times he tried to portray there were his other motivations. And um, it's interesting comparing that because like many people would have grown in that circumstance, would have grown up very similar to, the, be, the, to be like their father. Mm. And what do you think caused you to, to be a bit more self-reflective than your father was <laughs> and, <laughs> and to see that th- that kind of behaviour was actually out of harmony with, with love and truth? Mm. It's, a, it's a very good question, isn't it? Mm. It's, there were a number of factors. Firstly, my, my birth order, my placement in the family mm-hmm. did actually assist me. And the fact that my mother passed uh, while birthing me was quite a, uh, a strong... Um, had a, quite an imprint upon me. I, sure. I, this, this, uh, I'm not sure if resonance is the right word, but the, the resonance with this ideal of a mother mm-hmm. <laughs> helped me in many ways to be a little more distant mm-hmm. from my father. It's not clear in the books how many brothers and sisters you had, but I'm assuming you, of course you were the youngest, but was, did you have one brother and one sister? Indeed, yeah. yes. So I had a, a brother, and then this, then a sister, uh, then myself. Then yourself, yeah. Yes. So you were the third. Yes. Child born, and then and yes. your mother died during childbirth. That's right. That's right. Mm. And so um, that helped me to not be the absolute focus of my father's uh, attention as the as the older brother, as the been. male, as mm. the oldest male, and also obviously the grief at my mother's passing and the, the emotions the, that he had at my mother's passing also made him less connected to myself. So that, is, that, was, that did assist me. But that is not the whole story, obviously, because one can have that experience and then feel such a lack of the father's love that they aspire towards him. So I do credit, well... From this perspective, there are so many factors. <laughs> well, there are, there's a whole sleep state experience, which, you, which obviously was influencing you, your mother influencing you from your sleep state experience, which you wouldn't have been conscious of on earth, but, yes. but obviously it does have an influence, doesn't it, which it you can does. see in retrospect. But, it does. Yeah. And this, uh, this sense that I was very guided, not very guided, but assisted and given that encouragement from, from my spirit friends who I wasn't, yet aware of to keep following a moral path even when it felt as if everyone was opposing me and even when i questioned the morality of what i was doing <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> yes yeah. but but of course i uh, i cannot underestimate or understate the fact that i simply made choices i allowed the compassionate stirrings of my heart to be heard rather than suppressed. Yes. And that is the personal decision of each person regardless of where they come from and regardless of their childhood experience. And while, yes, certain ones of us are very disposed to ignoring those, those stirrings of the heart because of some terrible and even worse child 
child time experiences than myself. Um, what I learned in working with the poor and the, the socially isolated on earth is that many of them had experienced terrible things, but not all of them chose uh, a life of crime or not all mm. of them chose to be harmful or even bitter or mm. resentful. And this was further, I suppose there was many things that I was beginning to learn during my earth life that I had no conscious awareness of. The, the interactions that you have that then reinforce a sense within oneself, but you, you couldn't actually verbally define exactly what you are learning, if that makes sense. Yeah, until again you look back on it and then you mm. see, oh, that was the point that I started to take. That is yeah. the, the process of living, really, <laughs> it isn't is, it? Yeah. Uh, this it is. is how learning and change occurs. Yeah. But so I, I made choices in harmony with those compassionate stirrings and I didn't cease. Many people cease when yeah. they have pressure against them uh, or they allow, they allow their anger to be their guiding force yes. in terms of their actions. Yeah, manipulated by events into, into basically absorbing a moral condition that causes them to make decisions and choices that are out of harmony with God's truth and more in harmony with error on earth, isn't it? Yes, yeah. but the moral <laughs> state of each individual is attributed to that individual yes. in adulthood. And so yes. there is always the opportunity for change, the encouragement for change. Yes, yeah, and this is a, but it requires that self-reflection, which obviously you had a lot of mm. uh, in your, in your earth-based experience. Yes, and the reason for this, I, I can say perhaps the, the long hours spent on my own as a child. Yes. The the really almost the neglect of my family yes. <laughs> has caused me to be often very sad but also at times very aware of you get aware, more aware of what was the real driving factors of what was going on around you it seems and as a quiet as the the youngest child to be able to observe people in my direct environment who had already developed their will uh, somewhat. There was a gap between my sister and myself. Mm -hmm. I came later. Mm -hmm. And so to see my brother and my sister and my father all acting and to, to as the baby, to sort of be relegated to, to a position where I wasn't expected or demanded to be actively involved with them meant that I had many opportunities to observe and given that I also had this solitary time to reflect, and then given that my father had a really a resentment towards me because of the death of my mother, then the, the distancing of myself from my family unit and seeking somewhere else. Mm, and yeah. so then I got, I had the opportunity to see many other people who were exercising their choices and decisions in different ways to my family, which naturally created a sense of questioning. But again, I cannot, uh, I do, I must acknowledge that these choices were my own. They were not forced upon me. Yeah. These, these choices, I mean, to self-reflect or to, That's right. to listen to the stirring. Driven by heart. your own desire, not, mm. not the desires of others. It's quite a magical science, and it is a science, yeah. to observe how the individual's will and desire is impacted by the environment and their personal decisions. Yes. And how the, it's, it's a, a marvellous interplay. It's almost a symphony of the soul, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. which is very difficult to describe. Yeah, mm. and you would know to say, you know, we've been talking to Stuart lately who had been yes. observing my life a lot and, you know, he'd obviously have a lot of comments about those kind of things going on because he wanted to study those things for years. Yes, very interested. Yeah. And the second question I want to ask you, uh, well, there's a number of questions I really want to ask you about your earth life, but the, the second one was about your application of logic. Mm. It, 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 when I when I think about your life and look at all of the ways that you analyse things while you're on Earth, it seems to me that um, a lot of your decisions, even at times when you were feeling quite low and desolate, a lot of your decisions were still driven to a large degree by logic. 
Uh, and it seems to me that you used your logic in a way to assist you to make faith-based decisions. Yes, and isn't, isn't one's capacity for logic a wonderful tool? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of uh, safeguarding one's faith and mm. safeguarding one's growth and, in, and supporting it. What I wanted to ask you again is uh, uh, about, about logic was about like, what, what do you feel made you uh, apply logic in this way instead of how many people today apply so-called logic, which is they try to pick out the logic of the error and then, <laughs> and then they embrace the error using the logic as the excuse. Yes. <laughs> um, what caused you to do the opposite to that? Well, here perhaps I can, I can confess some anger in myself. I felt very angry uh, at my father at certain times in my life. And I felt angry about the injustice. Or I felt at a deep level at many times, I felt angry about my own loss as of my mother. And so... In a way, that anger fueled my logic. Your logic. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make sense? <clears throat> well, in a way, but we're, if we could be more specific. So... Did, did you... Do, are you saying that um, your logic was just a knee-jerk reaction to no, your relationship? No, Or no. are you saying... Because it seems to me your logic is really more... Uh, it was more practically applied than that. Um, so yeah. perhaps I could explain sure. a little... Uh, because it's not fair to say that all of my logic was driven by anger. Yeah. But when I went back to that childhood time on earth, which is such a long time ago now, I, I remember the sense of feeling already opposed to my father. And then because I was such a, a thoughtful and reflective child, then beginning to employ thought to consider why that was the case. And really, my anger fueled my differentiating from my father. So I was already, the anger was... So in some ways you were almost opposed to your father's sense of logic. <laughs> well, I was opposed to my father's beliefs. Yes. And, oh, I, no, there was just an opposition between my, me and my father. And then I looked for an understanding of why that was there. And then I looked at what he was so forcefully trying to push upon me and I felt angry about that push. And that caused me to want to resist the beliefs rather than engage them. And then because I was this thoughtful child, I then began to engage my thought and really consider what he was saying and consider the logic of it. Yes, so, so this logic tool was perhaps in the very inception of me coming to employ it based on a reactionary situation. It quickly changed to become something that was far more reasoned and steadfast. Mm. And, uh, but really, I was laughing because I was remembering back to, to my childhood anger. You call it childhood anger, but um, it's interesting how I would probably see it myself. Is it's, it seems to me that um, because you were sensitive and self-reflective, when somebody treated you unjustly, you allowed yourself to feel the injustice of it. Mm. And um, uh, what I noticed today is a lot of people don't do that. You know, they, they you know, for whatever reason, they want to maintain a relationship with their family in particular or whoever's treating them unjustly. So they ignore the feelings they have about it. What it seems to me is that you felt the lack of love and you allowed yourself to feel the lack of love. Yes, and I had a response. Yeah, I had and the a, response a, was a, anger. It was repelling. Mm. The, the lack of love was repelling. And yeah. in my early years, there was an anger about it. Yes. Mm. But what I noticed today a lot of people do is, firstly, they don't even allow themselves to feel their lack mm. of love that they, you know, in their environment. That's number one. And then, and then number two, if they do allow themselves to feel it, they get angry about it. But instead of being self-reflective about why they're angry and all those kind of things, mm. they they take out their anger on their environment, mm. which, which is a completely different thing to what you did. It's like, uh, absolutely. Yeah, because you, you, when you, what you did with that uh, feeling of a lack of love was you started to analyse it and use some logic uh, to, to consider why it existed and what was there and what was the reasoning and probably 
probably the, you knew your dad didn't like you before your dad knew he didn't like you. Yes. As a, re, as a result, uh, because you were sensitive to the feelings associated with it. So it, it seems to me that, uh, and this is what I wanted to bring up about the logic that you had, it's sort of, sort of like, even though you had the opportunity to, to really attack your father and blame him, it's like you were more self-reflective than that, even though you're angry. You were more self-reflective to that, and, and you allowed yourself to feel, oh, this is my feeling of a lack of love. There is a lack of love here mm. that you acknowledge to be true which seems to then drive a lot of other actions in your earth life. Yes, and, and then I could apply logic to that, that yes. the lack of love was what the lack of love was and then how, to, how that lack of love was creating unhappiness, not just for myself but for many people. Yes. And how I could really understand what was unloving and what would be loving. And that's what I mean. It became then a... A lifetime process of analyzing not to the exclusion of emotion but really based on my emotion then an analysis and then a reasoning I was able to see uh, this is the this is the situation within my father these are his beliefs and these are his rationalizations and these are his these are the things that are driving his behavior not just towards myself but towards himself and towards others there must be a flaw because i feel bad and i see yes. a negative effect so yeah. there must be a flaw so what is that flaw and if that's if that's what religion calls loving then that, obviously well that, there's a problem <laughs> that must be a problem so what yeah. is indeed loving and and then that became really a treasured process for me yeah. even though it exposed me to a lot of criticism I, I did enjoy my logic. Yeah, but it's, it's also interesting the other effect it had on your life on Earth, and that's just the effect of compassion. Mm. Because you, you don't see that a lot either on Earth anymore, where a person has a difficult process with their family or with others, and, and instead of you know, being angry at the world or whatever, they then say, well, I don't want, I, like, this, this lack of love feels bad for me. Mm-hmm how can I make other people who feel a lack of love feel better? It yes. seems to be the question that you were self-reflective enough to ask yourself. And I know you well, had to be pushed in the right direction to a degree by some spirit yes. friends who helped you do that at that critical time in your life when yes. you, you were really desolate from, from your relationship. Um, could, I, could I just clarify something, yeah, though? Yeah. Because I do see on the, on the planet at this moment there are many people... Not the majority, but there no. are many people who feel bad as a result of their their life's experience, and then wish to alleviate that bad feeling in other and people. other people, yeah. But often, because they aren't allowing that process you spoke of earlier of being sensitive and aware of really their initial hurt, they do a lot of things to make others in addiction, really. Yes, in addiction, as yeah. as you would rightly driven call driven it. by a wrong motivation. Wrong motivation to either quash the experience of other people so that they their own experience is not then uh, highlighted or highlighted exposed. or exposed with mm. or stirred up within themselves, or really to to um, indirectly punish the people who've harmed them through becoming angry at other people who are harming people in the same way. Yes or to really deal with the effects of yes. the harm. Yes. So there's, there's all of that occurring on the planet. And the distinction really I feel in my work on Earth was that not that I was driven to really... It was more a love... Well, it's so difficult to describe. There, there was a love for truth, desire to really tear down the untruth that society was based upon. And that the, creates the, a lot of pain and suffering. The class in others, structure, it? yes. Mm. So the things that were generating the suffering, I wish to alleviate the suffering, yeah. but really because I had employed this logic, I was very focused and aware of what was creating the the um the feeling of being unloved the the feeling the the suffering of others yes. and yes. and I was engaging with that within myself and yeah. and I was also speaking with people about that 
as I help them perhaps with effect-based things, but yeah. talking about the the injustice in the way that the society was treating them and yeah. the, the yeah. truth about their situation. And I yeah. think this is, again, what drove me uh, once I did enter the spirit world. I was so hungry for that truth about things, not just about the alleviation of suffering, but about the permanent removal of suffering yes. <laughs> from the planet mm. and very much my desire to to share what I did in the books was because I could see that even people who were affected by the sin of others on the planet, if they had a strong faith in the truth about God and about the, the spirit life, that much of their suffering would be erased immediately. Mm. No, it's very true. Perhaps if I can ask a bit more questions about your earth life, is that mm -hmm. okay? Some of these questions are a bit more private and you don't have to answer them if you don't want to. <laughs> and when uh, Willem Lee came to, as an intervening force, shall we say, in that time when you felt suicidal, mm. um, um, obviously that was quite a pivotal time in terms of moving you from a feeling of like utter desolation and, yes. so, and potential self-harm mm -hmm into uh, actually still des desiring to stay alive on earth even if it's just for the reason to help others yes it seems to me that uh, from that point of time from from what the books describe and and this is what i'm trying to help the listeners understand sort of your feelings at the time on earth and that that your you you obviously were having a the relationship that or, or the woman that you were interested in having a relationship with uh, rejected you mm -hmm. completely, mm -hmm. and as a result of that rejection, you felt quite desolate. This, of course, connecting you in retrospect, you could see now this connecting you to this feeling of rejection from your mother, obviously, yes. which yes. which which was where the real uh desolate feeling belonged yes yeah yes. so so you, it's quite easy to see that mm -hmm. um although probably many of the reasons probably haven't considered that i'd say um so so now when you look back at that uh, at that event the rejection from from that lady that you later helped in the spirit world and mm. um, what was her name again i forget her name i, I can't remember her name but and um, you you allowed um you obviously still allowed your feelings to feel like like overwhelmed by the fact of the rejection and and i was just wondering right at that time in your life could you describe some of the feelings you were having about that and did did you have any consciousness at all that it was connected to the the, the loss of your mother no firstly no mm. i at that time i had no awareness that it was connected to my mother I felt heartbroken and I felt, as you say, many of the feelings that uh, really had their origins with my mother, utterly rejected that my presence upon the earth was not wanted. Mm. And so that also came from my father. Um, that, but that sense that nobody wanted me, which was very much about, that was... Which was really in true infancy. in a way, wasn't it? It, like, it was there, true. There's very few people in your life that really wanted you. Mm. Yeah. That's true. That's true, mm. yes. Um, but, yes, yeah, so that's how I felt. And, and obviously there, there was anger as well mm, about, mm. about being on earth mm. <laughs> and, and really experiencing my own suffering. Um, so that's really how I felt at that time. And I felt that there was, there was not much point to my existence, but also that there was not much to hope for uh at that moment and that perhaps my wild imaginings of what was possible were just not possible were just not possible and that that there's much questioning that happened in my life on earth uh yeah. because uh, <laughs> of the lack of love that you experience in a lot of areas yes yeah. and the intense questioning of myself by others so yeah. rejection and uh, and you view it as crazy, basically, which yes. is very familiar to my feelings, yes. of course. <laughs> yeah. So, so looking at that period of time, then how how long was that before your actual death when you rescued the child? I it was some years. Yes, five or six years. Yes. 
So basically, the up until you were sort of mid, sort of mid, early to mid thirties, mm. wasn't it? Yeah, I think you died when you were forty or forty-one. Is that yes. true? Yeah. And um, so up until your mid thirties, um, obviously, um, you tried to have a relationship, or yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, um, so I grew up in this environment. Mm -hmm. oh, that we've touched upon and I began my own logical reasoning process. So mm. I was already separating from my family mm. much of the time. And I lived sort of in this strange in between space in, mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in English society where I wouldn't engage in the common norms of my class. Um, Which but, was what the upper middle class. Yes. Sort of, was it? Yeah. Yes. Um, but I didn't really fit in any other class. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the woman that I loved, and so I went out and tried to make my way in the world. And the woman that I loved, obviously, well, she saw in me something, mm. these things. But um, I was already interested in the, the, the truth of society, I suppose, before that relationship with her. And so I really, while, um, while after that experience where I was contemplating ending my own life, I really just dedicated my life to the assistance of others. There was already um, the inklings of that in terms of my rational thought, mm -hmm. in terms of that my rational thought was already challenging the society in which I lived in. And then when it became apparent that this relationship would not end in a happy marriage mm -hmm. as I wanted, that was then, as you say, a big turning point in so many ways. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what I referenced earlier about um, how fortunate I was to be guided and assisted by spirits while I was on earth. As many people, as spirits are attempting to do with everyone, of, of course. course. Yeah. Um, but uh, I was, that experience was so pivotal in my life, as you say. I, I suppose what I'd like to do with the discussion about what happened on earth for you, Afra, is... Um, there was that decision where uh, William and Lee just gave you a nudge, I suppose you could call it that. <laughs> I would call it quite a, well, a wonderful nudge. A yes, wonderful. A, a timely one. A probably. timely one and quite a pronounced one, really. Yeah. And, uh, but not only that, there, as you said, there was already the pre prior development that had occurred, yes. which allowed that nudge to happen because yes. it, Without that prior development, the nudge would have had no effect whatsoever. Yes. So, so he, he nudged you in the right direction and then nudged you again a, a month or two later, uh, or just one month later, wasn't it, mm. uh, around about. Um, did you feel a significant shift in your life when you followed that nudge, uh, like in terms of your general feeling of benefiting? Because like, obviously you had a feeling before then that you weren't, life wasn't really benefiting anybody no. in the world. And again, it was not so much that I felt, oh, suddenly I have a purpose because I'm benefiting people. No. That wasn't my experience. It was more that I felt invigorated. Yeah. I felt suddenly that I had found my purpose and I felt quite enlivened by that. Yeah. It was quite the contrast to it's my life before then. Yeah. And so I did feel filled up on this sort of, role or this yeah. this idea that I would be saving people. Yeah, or but, be a major player in the world or whatever, <laughs> as many people seem to be addicted to today, particularly yes. young men. Yes. Yeah. It was more a sense that I felt very finally at peace in yeah. a way, yeah. that finally there was an outlet for me. There was an outlet for all of this crazy reasonings and I had just been avoiding the thing that was the most natural thing for me to do. So looking at, at your life on Earth, and I suppose the reason why I'm asking these questions about your life on Earth is because uh, uh, I want to sort of help people understand uh, some of our fine other questions we're going to ask about the books, you know, in, mm -hmm. terms, of, in mm -hmm. terms of your statements in the books and so on. Yes. Um, but also to understand how your character um, was developed uh, not your, uh, you know, and how you followed your nature as well to a degree while you're on earth um, and how much of an impact that had on the way in which you passed that, uh, that sort of 
even though it was a traumatic event of, of an accident, which most people would sort of view as a major <laughs> problem mm. uh, for you at the time because it was an instantaneous death. Um, it was, it, it was uh, obviously quite an easy passing compared to what, uh, what I now observe many people actually having. Yes, and yeah. I alluded to this early on in our mm. discussion, didn't yeah. I? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I'm grateful for the life that I engaged on Earth because all of the actions and all of the reflection that I took ultimately led me to a place where I passed in the way that I did and I really have never experienced any regret about my passing. I really have not because I, I've, in a way, in a way I felt I was ready. <laughs> if yeah. that makes, uh, that's perhaps a little difficult to, or perhaps a little easy to misinterpret that statement because I certainly had no thoughts of passing no, uh, or desire no. to pass. I felt, as I said, that I, ha I felt finally at peace in myself that I had found my calling, even though I wouldn't have called it that. Um, just I had found a purpose that met with my innermost values and I felt I could unobtrusively go about doing that business and mm. it brought me a lot of fulfilment having contact with people, that was quite meaningful. Uh, much of the society I came from dealt in pleasantries and banality. And I found in the work that I did, it was very much... It, humanity was exposed in its many moods without much f frill or fuss or facade. And to me, that was a wonderful thing. And you're asking about the experiences that I had on earth and how that affected my passing. I feel that everything we've discussed so far, my childhood, my capacity or my propensity for self-reflection and, and deep thought, uh, along with the, the dynamics of my family and my, really my nature is adverse to, to uh, anything that's ostentatious. And so that assisted me also. <laughs> mm. um, I employed logic. I did a great many of these things that, that ultimately led me to that place where I did face really desolation and then made a positive choice. And I was able on earth to experience the, the invigoration that happens when one reaches that point and faces it and is assisted and but then of their own free will makes a positive choice and so all of those experiences obviously impacted very favorably on my passing because mm. I had confronted many things that most people never confront in their earth life such as you, even facing the desolation that I faced yes. and moving beyond it in a positive sense Many people live in this state we were speaking of, which is, in essence, uh, there is a lot of desolation underpinning that mm. angry hopelessness that mm. people are unwilling to confront. And so by confronting that and making a positive choice, finding finally where I felt at home and continuing to act on that, continuing to employ my logic, continuing to to heed the, the callings of my heart and what felt most real and true and moral and right, all of those things then made my passing seamless, as, as you mm. have, have written about. Mm. And certainly there was no trauma associated with my death. And, mm. and while it was the furthest thing from my mind, mm. it was also not unwelcome. It's, it's a difficult to describe having faced really a suicidal feeling where death was would be welcome wanted. or yearned for or there was so much yeah, um, angry, angry feelings about it. But then when I did pass, it was not so much of uh, – it wasn't wonderful news and it wasn't terrible news. It was just – uh, news. <laughs> news. <laughs> can I can I maybe maybe put it more succinctly in the sense of um, it? It seems to me that you uh, 
that you're passing in a lot of ways. Um, you say you were ready sort of for it uh, in the sense, and, and perhaps uh, we could say to people on earth, w w when you read through your books, you get the inkling of this, that, that there was really no one on earth you could call a friend. Yes, there was no attachments There was no attachments earth. on earth. There, yes. there, were, there were no major things on earth that were drawing you to earth. Mm -hmm. And so once you get to that point where you don't really feel like there's anything major keeping you at earth, and obviously if you pass, it's neither here nor there. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and as you uh, know, it was actually, uh, as I said in the very beginning of our discussion, it was such a resounding gift of faith because mm. suddenly the things I had hoped for were true and mm. that was a wonderful thing. And in a lot of ways your passing was fitting, wasn't it? Um, mm. In the sense that it was the saving of a, the attempt to save the life of, mm. a, of a young lad mm. that uh, caused your passing. And obviously, as you also state in your book, that, that was that attempt you know, as, as was pointed out to you by others uh, during the Gate of Heaven book, um, that attempt to save the life was, was actually because of a whole series of events that had happened before then. Yes. And it was really the embodiment of those things that I had been fostering mm. inside of myself. The, the uh, care and attentiveness for those that society was, uh, that the constructs of society were creating suffering for mm. um, just even the the awareness of of the young the young man the, the young lad getting under the, the young boy in the, in the path of the horse the, yes yeah. yes that yeah. awareness and and the the feeling that um, that I would like for him to live and that I was not too concerned about whether you did or not. Yes, yeah, so again, that could be misinterpreted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It's really just that his life was very important. important. To you. Yes. yes, at yes. least of equal value to my own. Yes, and the, and that you know obviously had a large bearing too on the, as it was called the, the final judgment of your life on earth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I suppose just before we go, because it, you know, Mary, you know, Mary's fairly tired, so we, we'll. Uh, we have to go fairly soon, but I was I was wondering whether um, uh, just a few basic questions about spirit life. If Please, that's all right. I welcome, I welcome, and really, we do not need to hurry. There's no, some no. energy. <laughs> There's some energy left, so. And I, I was wondering, uh, you, you obviously you've met your soulmate. Yes. Yes. <laughs> can can we have a bit of uh, knowledge about that? <laughs> you know, a bit of information about who your soulmate is and 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 where they lived on Earth when you were on Earth and so forth? Yes. Um, so I mean, naturally, I will say that she is wonderful <laughs> <laughs> and that we are in, in good contact now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, she did, when did she pass? Uh, some years after myself. Right, so she was after, on Earth. Yes, yeah. after um, the publication of the books. Yeah, yes. yeah. And, and so she passed sort of as an older woman, I gather. Yes. Yes. Um, and uh, you passed uh, from memory 1899, was that? Uh, no, it would have been earlier than that. In the, in the 1800s, wouldn't it? Mm. Yeah. So I was asking about your song, mate, and we had to have a pause because Mary got a bit confused about the timeline here, uh, which I had already suspected, but Mary was a bit confused about. So, so we'll just rewind a little. And, and if, if, our, if your readers remember from, you know, the people who have read all three of the trilogy, you know, mm. The Gate of Heaven as well, the last one, and, and then The Life of Lee was the middle one, and the, the, uh, Through the Mist was the first one. But in, in The Gate of Heaven... They'll remember that you were brought to a woman who you knew on earth, who happened to be the woman who, who you felt devastated, who, who, uh, that she rejected you. Yes. Um, and, um, and this was in the gate of heaven. It was like close to, well, over 30 years later, wasn't it, um, mm. from your passing. Mm. So it's quite a significant time. You passed in your 40s, so assuming she was a similar age to yourself or thereabouts, she would have passed in her 60s probably or, or thereabouts or her 60s or 70s. And 
yes, this is this was the point that that Mary got confused. Yes. 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 So so. And um, we were talking about your soulmate, and you said, "Yes, you've obviously with her." And the question I was coming to was, "Was your soulmate the woman who rejected you?" Yes, yes. and in fact, it was. Yes. It was. It is. Yes, it is yeah. <laughs> but uh, poor Mary was so concerned that I was showing her very clearly yeah. that <laughs> that that scene where we did meet each other again. Yes. Uh, but she felt concerned that somehow. She would misconvey the information, but indeed, that that was that is her, and and uh, there was a double thing going on in this rejection, wasn't there on Earth? If we look at that now, because there was this rejection from your mother yeah. uh, that you felt, or and yes. your family, but that also there was this now your soulmate, uh, yes. who you probably wouldn't have realised, but you probably had a feeling might be your soulmate on Earth was also rejecting you. Yes. And, of course, that is a quite intense sort of a feeling coming yes. into from the other half of the soul. Yes. So, obviously, that had quite a severe impact at the time. Yes. And while I felt quite sensitive, to some degree, I had felt that I was aware of my sadness about my mother's passing when I was quite young. Uh, it was really that that moment of the rejection that then that brought everything to a very heightened state mm. within me and i'm very fortunate for the for the passage of or the journey that i had in the spirit life that i it was natural that i should meet up with my mother so soon uh because she had been such a focus of my intention and attention on earth mm. uh but there was still a uh, grief, really. Related to that soulmate rejection. With, yes, mm. Claire is mm. her name. Claire. With Claire. Um, and so, and so it, it did take me some time to be open to, to enough to, to meet her again. It was a wonderful thing, a very moving thing. Again, interestingly, and, though, it was Willie Malee who yes. made the suggestion. An old friend. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> You've got a fair bit to be thankful for yes. from, from him, haven't you? Yes, I can understand. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And really the, the, the passage in the book is just the very, very beginning for us. Yes. And I do feel that we began there at that moment rather than... In the earth life. In the earth life. Well, perhaps that's an unfair assessment, but really I was so much more consciously aware of myself uh, and and aware of truth, and this really helped me to really recognise her. Yeah, and obviously and, she had a lot of f bad feelings associated with her rejection of you too. Yes, a lot of guilt and shame because it, it really, in a sense, she did bow to societal pressure. Uh, and she was of a middle upper middle class too, was she? Yes, yes, yes. and yeah. so while. Um, while the match should have been technically condoned, her family placed a lot of pressure on her. Because um, you were strange. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds and like I myself didn't... and Mary, doesn't it? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I made no secret of it either. No. I made no, no secret of my beliefs and opinions yes. when, when asked and questioned. And because I was... you had such a love for truth, you had yes. to express them. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and, and also she had other issues from her earth life mm. where... She didn't really have something that attracted me to her was that she didn't have the strong sense of um, perhaps superiority or or facade that many of her peers did, and uh, but that was there were some really feelings of feeling bad about herself that were driving that and. Mm. And when I encountered her in that, uh, in that spirit state, there was a lot for her about not only her rejection of myself, but just about her, really her dark feelings about herself in general mm. that uh, she was being assisted with. When you met her in, uh, in that sort of hellish state, if we could say that, because that's probably mm. what it was for her, mm. um, how many years had she been passed by then? A number. A number, a yeah. number. Yeah. yes. So she'd already sort of experienced that state for such a long time. Yes. As well. 
Five years, really. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair while to experience it, isn't it? To actually experience it. Most spirits try to zone out of it, mm. of course, but that's right. to actually experience it is... She's, she's a wonderful, courageous yeah. woman. Yeah. And did it take a long spirit. after that to, to progress? Yeah. Obviously, you would have been very interested in the progress after that. Yes, and it, perhaps it was that length of time in that state that then once... Once we were able to meet again, and that that assisted her to not alleviate, but work through some of that guilt and punishment that she had had of herself about mm. our interaction, and the fact that she had been in that state for such a long time that she was really ready or or open or or her suffering had been such that she was ripe for change yes. and so yeah. while her her and my progression together uh, uh growing towards each other would have taken time it took time mm. but she definitely began to make such positive changes yeah. um from that moment onwards yeah. uh, it, we both feel immensely humbled by the love of our spirit friends who really assisted us to reconnect Yes. Um, it was such a source of sorrow for both of us. That it might have been a lot longer. That it took. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And so we, we yeah. were very grateful. Yeah, and that's what uh, I find too, that most probably doesn't strike a lot of people who are reading the books. But to me, it's a, it's a, it's a love story <laughs> without anybody really knowing it is. Yeah. But also it, it's, a, it, it's a love story in two ways. It's a love of God's story. Yes. Love, a love of true story. And so God's love for us. God's story. love for us story. And yes. your love, like this, this soulmate love story is really yes. as well. Yes. And, and I feel that a lot of people who read the books don't probably understand that because they probably don't feel that connection between Claire and yourself when, when you meet, mention mm. her in the book. It's sort of like an experience only mm. uh, that is mentioned in the book, but without having a feeling for you, I suppose it'd be very difficult for them to interpret that as, as oh, there's, there's your meeting of your soulmate. Yes, mm. yes. And the, the books, and I, I had much assistance in writing. Yeah, of course. Not just from Mr. Lee's, but yeah, from of course. <laughs> my guides and yeah. assistants and yeah. friends here in yeah. this life. And so um, many times it's possible, as you personally know, to read the books and then reread them and, yeah, and as, that's why I keep reading as one, them. I, I've not stopped, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> as one develops, yeah. there is so much. As one really develops faith, and, mm. and perhaps that's where we can leave our conversation for today mm. because that's how we started it, wasn't it? Mm. That, that faith, it, that was my desire in gifting the books, was to, to elevate the faith of people on earth. And, and really what I notice is that if one does embark on a journey of improving their faith, then the, the gifts that the books give continue to grow and extend and there are more. Yeah, so I would definitely recommend to all of our listeners that you definitely do not stop at one reading. Um, as I said, I've probably read each book 20 times at mm. least by now, um, at least. Mm. And every time uh, I read them, I... I, I you know, you connect to more things. And for us, of course, for Mary and myself, reading them, there's a lot of memories as well. So that helps us process through a lot of things emotionally. But, but for other people reading them, they'll realise that every time you read them, if you've grown emotionally, if you've grown spiritually and you've grown in your relationship with God, you get a different thing out of the same passage yes. every time. And this is what I love about books based upon truth, mm. is that... Is that they are not just something that's an experience that is once had. It's over. It's an experience that you can go back to them over and over and learn another thing each time. Mm-hmm. And, 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 it's, and this is what I love about God's truth, isn't it? It's like that. It's timeless yes. in the sense that you can go back over it and back over it so many times. And each time there's a new thing that you learn and, uh, and understand that you didn't get before. Yes. So it's, yeah. and- it does make my heart glad mm. that, that it assists you in that way because yeah. it was always my intention. And, yes, it's yeah, just I, a wonderful Honestly, thing. without your book, books, I feel I probably would have struggled emotionally to connect to some of the feelings that I can connect to in reading them. 
And this is uh, perhaps I could encourage you in some very humble way that this, the power of um, truth and uh, an expression of love on earth, as you have experienced through the books, I really did so much to ensure the purity of the message. Mm -hmm. There are moments where it is perhaps not exactly as I intended, mm. but um, there is so I wanted to build and share so much of the the truth about the love that that God has for us that is demonstrated through every experience in the mm. spirit life and mm. to have something of such a a strength on earth does really uh, have the capacity to impact people for for eternity on the earth mm. and so I know that many times you feel weary and that mm. many times you feel well particularly lately you know yes. I'm going through some tough emotions lately and uh, emotions that have been there since for my whole life these emotions and so lately at times I feel um, pretty well I never really feel hopeless but you know obviously I feel quite sad a lot of the times and and uh, yeah I find that's why I find them so encouraging as well because it, they're a constant reminder of um, for us they're a constant reminder of our spirit life <laughs> Which, which in itself is good to remember because mm. while we've got a lot of grief associated with our spirit life, Mary and myself and others of the 14, but there's also a lot of wonderful things that happen in our spirit life that, that, uh, yes. that um, you know, we don't allow ourselves to feel about and think about very much here because of the grief that's triggered every time we think about mm. it. And, and so, you know, having a book where you can relate to many of the experiences uh, is is also wonderful, you know. Obviously, uh, for us, it's a wonderful thing. Between that and the pageant messages, you know, it's uh, been of great assistance to my, you know, my own process of development. So that's why I want to thank you personally for the effort and and Robert as well, you know, because yes. obviously he must have taken quite a lot of his of his life uh, mm. to pen. What a, what a character as mm, well. What, a, mm. what an interesting gentleman he, he, mm. he is. He is, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. yes. Yeah. but in his, in his earth life also a yeah. very interesting life. And yeah. One that wasn't dissimilar to mine in many, many respects. Yeah, and this is why I think in, in our future conversations what would be great if we can gather Robert as well, <laughs> if he's willing to come uh, yeah. along for the conversation about just the books themselves and, and the things we want to ask about the books themselves and... Uh, in our future discussions, if he if he would be willing to come along and give his perspective about that, that let's you know, try as well, to that'd arrange be great it. If we can arrange that, let's try to arrange it. Yeah. Uh, do you keep in contact? Is he keeping in contact with you a bit more regularly now than he did a few years ago, or is that still? Well, I wouldn't say that we are in a lot of contact. <coughs> we we have mm. uh, affection for each other. Yeah. Uh, and certainly he has made some changes. Yeah. Uh, but because when we met a few years ago, he was still quite resistive to even. Having conversed with you, I think I don't think he'd had actually no. had a conversation with you after no. his passing. Yeah. So um, yeah, so that that's what we'd like to do if mm -hmm. we could, and and also clarify some bits and pieces in the books uh, that I yes. sort of feel that um, probably you'd like to have had a bit more uh, accuracy mm. with, and mm. and to also help mediums on Earth. Tra trace the source of the inaccuracy, <laughs> if we can yes. do that as well. Yeah. And that would also be quite a good thing too, I think, because that, as you know, one of the things we're trying to do is encourage people to develop their mediumship, but to develop in a pure, pure sort of way as well. Mm. Yeah. But I'd like to thank you for your time today. It's, coming. it's really, truly my deepest pleasure, Fred. Yeah, and, uh, and maybe next time we can have a chat with Claire a bit as well and, mm. and talk to her about her experiences too. Oh, there's one further question I want to ask you just before you went. Okay. And that was... Um, uh, when you look back at it now, when you first passed and you arrived at your nice palatial home that you thought was palatial yes. at the time, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you've got a few you more. You want to palaces. ask me about my home now and how it compares? Yeah. Well, yes. well firstly, I'd like to ask what what sphere was that in um, your your home as you the, describe it? The second sphere. The second sphere. Yeah. Yes. So 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 we wanted to just confirm that for our viewers that it was the second sphere. And and where where is the home of your uh, you know what sphere is your home in now? Obviously not the same home. <laughs> no, vastly different home. I'm in the ninth sphere now. Ninth sphere now. So um, 
Yeah, so quite a bit removed from the second. Yes. Yeah. And it took that 30-year process uh, after passing to, to get to... And, and the gate of heaven, to my mind, doesn't describe the transition between the seventh and the eighth. Is that true? No, that's correct. Yeah. That was more... And it's difficult. There's so many transitions made, but exactly. really, it's between the sixth and the seventh. I that's think, right. That's your the, viewers the yeah. most. That's where. That's understand. what I felt when yes. I was reading it too. So, um, so the uh, the gate of heaven was the last time we heard from you. Yes. So we missed out on the love story. <laughs> <laughs> So, so it'd be, be nice to get a bit more of that. Story Are you well. proposing another book? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, this is the other thing, isn't it, that about this mediumship. Um, it has so much power yes. to do good on earth. It does. And, and, uh, and there is just so much information that's available through uh, mediumship to people on earth, uh, scientific as well as uh, like personal experience-based information that can greatly serve people on earth. And yet, like, the amount of mediums now who are developed to that degree who can receive that kind of information is, uh, it, it's not great, is it? It's not, it's, it could I, be better. I feel the potential exists. Of course, But yeah. the desire is not, it's not inherent there. in them. That's right. So, and, and also, I feel it will assist a great many mediums to understand, to have faith in what is possible. Yes, yes. Uh, because uh, many are not really in tune with that at this well point. yeah many mediums seem to get to the stage where they have very set personal beliefs mm. about life after death and many of those beliefs are obviously set by spirits who are either in the first sphere or earthbound mm. and because other spirits are speaking to most commonly mm. and as a result of that uh, the the mediums themselves don't have much faith in this higher and and brighter condition and so, therefore, it's very difficult for them to aspire to communicate with people in that condition, isn't it? So. That's that's correct. Mm. And for many mediums, it becomes their bread and butter, as it were. Yes. And then they... Then there's a lot of addictive motivations after yes, that. Yes, and also they're locked into a way of operating. Yes. Because it provides their, their the financial security. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, so we'd like to try and uh, help that process a little bit by... Have, hearing some of these experiences at least mm -hmm. and uh, and certainly yes if you want to come and uh, and someone pen the book I'll, I'll be happy to do that for you <laughs> it's not a problem and but uh maybe perhaps i've got a few books of my own i need to write too yes. but uh, and get around to that at some point but um yeah we'd like to thank you for again for writing them but also thank all of our spirit friends all of the, your spirit friends who were involved in mm -hmm in leading you to that point where you, yes. you could communicate with Robert and there is no there is never any mm. effort that is achieved by just by one, one person. person alone exactly never yeah. yeah and you know this is what we're trying to encourage with all the people who are helping us here on earth at the moment is to realize that every little bit of help uh, actually creates a combined effort which is yes. quite powerful yes yeah right. But thank you for your time and, then, and, uh, and thank you for describing some of those events of your life on earth and maybe some of our listeners can have a bit more of a connection now with you as the person and, and understand what it felt for you when you're on earth. <laughs> and, and in the future discussions, we'd like to talk a bit more about your spirit uh, experience and, and, and a bit more about the experiences that you didn't describe in the, the, the many multitude of experiences that you had to leave out. <laughs> yes, so many. Yeah. That, would be, that would be a great a great undertaking. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Okay, well, thank you for your time. And, and uh, we'd like to just thank our listeners as well for listening to our discussion with you. And, uh, and hopefully when we have a few more discussions, you'll return and we'll be able to uh, confirm a few of the other things. And also, if people have some questions about the book, would you mind... Not at would all. Would you mind answering some of those? I, if they that would some? be fun. So we might start a little uh, library of questions yes. uh, about the three books. The, 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 the first one being Through the Mist... The second one being The Life of Elysian and the third, The Gate of Heaven, written by Robert James Lees, but, but authored, obviously, by our guest, Afra. <laughs> and, and we can ask you, uh, they can, some of our listeners maybe could ask you some direct questions about, about different things that you, or confusions they have about the experiences of, that have happened in your book. And, and that way you give a bit more information to them directly. So thanks for that, and uh, thank thanks for our time with you guys, our listeners, and thank you for our recording studio people who are still in the learning phase, and uh, we have our 
new team is is getting getting going outside as well so we'd like to thank you guys for doing your hard work in learning and also taking recording today thanks guys we'll see you later and uh see you well maybe tomorrow we'll see <laughs> we'll see <laughs> catch you later